Amen. All right. John chapter 3, of course, is extremely famous passage, and uh, I'm actually going to be focusing in on John 3.16 this morning uh, at the title of my sermon is, For God So Loved the World. Now, before I even get started, you know, I'm going to read for you from Luke chapter 11, verse 42, just one verse, and we've covered this recently because I just preached a sermon not that long ago on judgment and judging and judging others and how it's not a sin and people take that out of context. I'm not going to re-preach that whole sermon this morning. But Luke 11, 42 says, But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. And in this passage, of course, Jesus Christ is rebuking the Pharisees, he's rebuking the scribes. They're a bunch of hypocrites. And he's saying, you know, we focus on all these small things. You focus on paying tithe of the smallest of things, you know, but hey, you're, you're making sure you're paying that tithe. And, and that's their focal point. And he's saying, but you've completely passed over judgment. You've completely passed over the love of God. He said, these things ought you to have done. So when they're paying their tithe of the small things, he said, you know what? You should be doing that. But not to leave the other undone. You see, oh, you're, you're focused so much on these little details, the finer points, and completely missing the big picture and the, and the most important things. You know, they're straining at a gnat, the Bible says, and they're swallowing a camel. So they're worried about not getting the, the, you know, the little tiny gnat getting in their water or whatever, but they just end up swallowing an entire camel. That's what the Pharisees did. Now, the reason why I'm bringing up this verse is because I brought this up when I preached on judgment. Because Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees for leaving off judgment, righteous judgment, the judgment according to God's law. See, people have this, this, this false view of the Pharisees thinking that, oh man, they were real sticklers for the law. They didn't. They, they were hypocrites. Whatever they taught, first of all, they didn't do. And the Pharisees were people who put the tradition of men above the word of God. They taught their own man-made tradition, not what God's word said. So, you know, don't, don't let the, the world or the current culture deceive you on what the Pharisees, who they were and what they're all about, because it wasn't that they were these legalists, because we get accused of being legalists because we love the law of the Lord. Amen. But all of that said, because I don't want to go down that, I've already preached that sermon. Go back and listen a couple weeks ago. I preached that entire sermon. Now we're going to focus on the love of God. Because he's also rebuking them for leaving out the love of God. And look, this is important. I know it's fun to hear the, you know, sometimes it is, maybe, I don't know. It's fun for me. I love, I love the hard preaching. And this is a church where we're going to, you're going to hear preaching on sin. You're going to hear all these areas. Why? Because we need to improve. We need to grow. We need to have things pointed out where we're, we're failing, where we're wrong, where we need to, to improve and change and get right with God. But that can't be all that's being taught and all that's being preached and all we're focused on. We need the love of God. We need to be exhorted. We need to be encouraged. We need to be edified. So this morning, what I'm hoping to do is exhort you, edify you, encourage you by just looking at and studying and understanding the love of God. The Bible says uh, in 1 Timothy, you know, the Apostle Paul is giving advice to Timothy. And not just advice, but instruction. And he's kind of teaching him what to do, how to do it, and, and how to be an elder, how to be a preacher. And he tells him, you know, a very famous verse, preach the word. Be instant, in season, and out of season. It doesn't matter if things are popular or not. Look, you just preach God's word. Whether, whether people like it or lump it, you know, just preach God's word. That's your job. And then it says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, when he tells them to reprove and rebuke, those are, if you will, negative words, right? It's telling people that they're wrong. When you reprove, you're saying, hey, you're wrong about this. And I'm going to prove it to you. When you rebuke someone, you say, hey, you're doing this wrong, right? You shouldn't be sinning. Stop sinning. This is bad. But then when you exhort somebody, you're encouraging them, you're edifying them, you're helping them out. So 
again, we try to keep, I try to keep the right balance. And when you read the Bible, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find there's a lot more of like the law and you got to follow this and, and what you might consider to be negative things. But there's also a lot of positive, but there seems to be more heavily weighed towards, you know, the negative side. Just as in the Bible as a whole, that's just the way that it reads. And so for me as a, as a pastor, I'm trying to maintain the right balance, a biblical balance to say, you know what, we need to hear about sin. We need to hear about preaching about the law. We need to hear about these things. We need to be reproved. You need to be rebuked. But you also need to be exhorted. And we need to be encouraged. And you can't just feel like you're beat down because, man, I'm just failing everywhere. I'm such a sinner. I can't get anything right. And then you just fall into despair because <laughs> you're not being encouraged at all. You're not being edified at all. We need to be built up because this world can beat you down, because we can get into sin, because there are things that's going to make you just feel like, man, I'm defeated. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. You know, we need as a church to be edifying one another and provoking one another unto love and to good works because here is a common failure of man in general, the, the saved, born-again man. When, when a person gets into sin, and I think especially with men as opposed to women, but this, is, this can happen to anybody, when somebody starts having a bad attitude or a bad spirit and they don't really want to serve God, and, and they're starting to backslide. The tendency, unfortunately, even though the person knows what's right, is to then come to church even less and stop going and say, well, I, you know, well, I've been sinning in this area or sinning in that area, so I just don't feel I'm not even going to go to church. And I'll tell you what, that is the wrong choice. And I could preach that till I'm blue in the face, but I still see Witness, hear the examples of people who are good people. They love God in general, right? But they're, but they're, but they're failing in an area. They're, they're, start, they're getting into sin. They're kind of getting out. They're, they're losing their zeal. And then they just stop coming to church. Look, you need to just plow through and come. And we need to be encouraging people that are here. To keep pushing forward, to keep going. Look, when things get bad or when you, when you start to slide a little bit, we're trying to help. No, no, come on. Stay with it. Stay at it. Because, I mean, if you can't get that here, then where are you going to get it? I mean, what you get outside of church is people berating you, belittling you because you believe the Bible, because you have high standards, because you want to live according to God's word. And all you're going to get out there is mockery. You need the family here encouraging and helping and saying, hey, stay with it. This is what we need. So I want to touch on th this morning and this evening sermon are both going to be about the love of God. The first this morning I'm teaching on God's love for us. For God so loved the world and what God did for us and, and realize this and realize that God loves you. You know, you might hear that a lot. It's easy to come off the tongue, but I want you to realize that and think about it and understand, you know, in the midst of all the rules and the commandments we're trying to follow this stuff, God loves you. God loves you. And he has done so many. He's already proven his love for you. And that alone ought to encourage you and motivate you and help you, especially when you start to fail. John chapter 3, look at verse 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Most popular, common, well-known verse in the entire Bible. We go out soul winning, we talk to people. I like using this verse because it's familiar with people, but how many times, and I know I was someone who's included in this, 
You could know the verse, you could have heard the verse, but you don't, so many people don't even think about it and have never really thought about this one verse or meditated on it to what it actually is saying and what it means. Now, the point I usually go with with people is that, hey, it says, whosoever believeth. It doesn't say whosoever goes to church, whosoever lives a good life, whosoever turns a new leaf, whosoever gets rid of sin. No, it says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? That's the gospel. That's one of the reasons why it's so popular. But that first part, for God so loved the world, God loved the whole world and wanted everybody to get saved so much that he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son. And from time to time, I'll bring this up too, because you want to demonstrate how much God loves people. God loves the lost. God wants people to be saved. And God has loved you so much. If you could imagine giving up your, if you only had one son, one child on this earth, man, you know, People, couples, they, they, they want to have children in general, by and large. You want to have that child. And there's people here, I'm sure, that you want to have a child that don't have a child yet. Or maybe you have a child. I can't imagine. Look, I've got multiple children. I can't imagine giving any of them up for someone else. I mean, be willing to say, okay, Johnny, I'm going to give you as a sacrifice and not just a sacrifice for maybe someone else in my family, maybe someone else that's close to me. No, I'm going to give you for a sacrifice to people who do me wrong, to people who are just, you know, I tell them to do stuff. They're not doing it. Many times they don't want to hear it. They don't have nothing to do with me but I'm going to still offer you up for those people. That's the love of God. Amen. That passes the love of man so far and above to be willing to say, not, and not just a son, my only begotten son, special. I'm going to offer you up as a sacrifice for people who have blasphemed my name broken my commandments, don't want to hear it, and still give. That is an amazing love. And you know what? That's the love that we need to share with people. People need to understand that. And, and you know what? That love can draw people to Christ, to God, when you understand, hey, because what people focus on oftentimes in the world is the wrong thing. They focus on, oh man, well, why did God allow this bad thing to happen in my life and that bad thing to happen and this happened in my life? Well, why don't you turn it around a little bit and say, well, what have you done? What about your own sins? Let's look at that first before you look at other bad things that have happened in your life. Why don't we look at the bad choices that you've made and all the mistakes that you've made and all the times that you've spit in God's face and then we'll talk about the love of God how he still gave his only begotten son to pay for your sins. And you want to talk about how bad God is and, and how horrible it is that he allowed things to happen in your life? Why don't we look at the love of God and thank God that he didn't, as he well could have and would have been completely righteous to do, say, I want to have nothing to do with you. Depart from me that work iniquity and cast everybody into the lake of fire. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Say, none of you measure up. And it would be completely righteous of God to say, well, that's what you get now. I warned you. I told you. I taught you. And you still chose the wrong path. There you go. Because that's what we deserve. But we have a God with an immeasurable amount of love. And that should be encouraging. That should be enough to help you get through. The Bible says in verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come to just tell everybody how they're so wrong and how they're going to hell. He wasn't like Ray Comfort going through all the lists and just making sure people just knew that, hey man, you're going to hell. And then if people say, well, I'm not, you know, are you gonna are you gonna quit sinning? Are you gonna you know, are you gonna keep doing it? Well, all right, see ya. You're condemned then. 
That's not why Jesus came. It says that, but that the world through him might be saved. God wants the world to be saved. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter if you're born in an Arab country. It doesn't matter if you're born in an African country or in a, in a you know, North American country, South America. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter what your lineage is. It doesn't matter if you're of the chosen people. God so loved the world. He sent Jesus Christ into the world that the world through him might be saved. That's the purpose that was the whole goal. That was the whole point of the sacrifice. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Another thing that just proves how much God loves us is the fact that salvation is easy for us. Now, don't get me wrong. It wasn't easy for Jesus Christ, but it's easy for us it wasn't easy for the person purchasing the gift. It wasn't easy for the person who had to sacrifice and live the perfect life and do all the miracles and suffer on the cross, shed his blood, be mocked, be ridiculed, be spit upon, knowing that he's the son of God and still suffer the shame, even the shame of the cross. To be murdered for his soul to descend into hell for those three days and three nights before the resurrection. Doing all of that because we sin, because we broke God's law, because we deserve the punishment. He went and did that for us. And in God's mercy and love, that whole payment, he goes... I love you. Here's the gift. Please take it. Please receive it. I want you to be with me. I want to pardon all of your sins. And the opportunity is here. It's already been bought and paid for. You just need to receive it. Just take it. Please, just take it. You can't get more loving than that. That's right. You just can't. Everything packaged, ready, just receive it. Not even asking you to do the works. Just take the gift. This also helps understand the wrath of God, too for those that reject the gift. When you do absolutely everything, you sacrifice your own son, and then someone's going to turn around and reject that gift? It makes sense why people go to hell, to a place of eternal torture and torment. And it's not because God wanted them to go to that place either. They chose. Like the Bible says in Proverbs 1, hey, I held out my hand and no man regarded. He's there. He's ready. He's quick to save. But, but when you refuse, he says, therefore, I'm, I'm going to laugh when your calamity cometh. He says, I'm going to mock. When the whirlwind cometh and destruction, he says, fine. Why? Because he gave you an opportunity. John chapter 3, of course, also in the beginning of the chapter refers to Jesus Christ says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this is the next point I want to make about God's love for us. You know, it talks about a new birth. It's about being born again. Well, when a person is born again, when you're born, you're born into a family. When you're born again, you're born to become a child of God yourself. You are adopted into God's family. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. 
This is the manner. The manner is that we should be called the sons of sinners, unrighteous people who don't deserve it at all, who, who deserve a punishment that not only does he save our souls, but he also gives us a title. He also gives us access to be called a son of God, to be in his family, to be part of his family because he wants to have that relationship with us as a father and a son have to be part of his, of, of, of his family. Love is vital in a family relationship, by the way. You know, your children may be disciplined. You might have a family where they are really good on the discipline. Their children will fall in line. They can walk in. They can march in like they're in the military, right? And they've got the fear of dad just nailed down. They don't want to slip up for a second because, whew, right? And you could, you could have them in order. But I'll tell you what, if the love's not there, if there's no real love there, it's all for nothing. You have to have, I mean, you have to have the love. Otherwise, those children, they'll obey just out of fear of, of the reprisal, but when they get older, you think they're gonna, gonna follow all the rules that you had laid out for them when, when you're no longer just watching over yourself? Of course not. Not without the love, because they need the love to enforce the teaching. They need to understand that the love is even why the discipline is there. Turn, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter number 2. And I'm not saying that we don't discipline our children. Of course we do. But look, you, you can't have discipline without the love. The love is vital. Your children need to know that. They need to feel it. We need to feel that from God. We need to understand that. We need to see that. God loves us. And we can see all the sacrifice that God made for us and know, and know it's real. So when we're struggling maybe with obeying commandments and, and, and trying to do what's right, we can still see, well, I know that God loves me. He did so much for me. Now all of a sudden, now, now it's like, well, how hard can it be? I mean, may, maybe I should rethink how much I want to break this commandment when he's already done so much for me. See, the respect of, of that you gain from people being obedient or submissive to you, whether it be a husband and wife, whether it be children and parents, okay? As the one who's receiving the respect, you need to show that love. So the husbands, hey, you have to show the lo love your wife as your own self. Love your wife as your own body. When your wife can see that love, they're going to be a lot more likely to be submissive to you. When your children see the love that you have for them and the sacrifices that you make, you know what? They're going to be a lot more likely to listen to your commandments and your rules because they know that you love them. They're going to have that trust with that love. And when we see and understand and the best that we can see God's love for us, it should help us to become more obedient to God, to the Father, to His rules, to His commandments, to, to try to fall in line with what He wants. Why? Because He's already demonstrated His love for us. It's completely unreasonable to not want to follow and obey His commandments when He's already done so much for us. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Again, talking about what Jesus did for us. Jesus, in heaven, part of, of the, the triune God, came down to earth and was made a little lower than the angels, a little lower than another creation, became a man, became a human being that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, 
for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Not only have we been adopted into the family, and we've already received that love and the honor of being called the Son of God through just a free gift, through the grace of God, through the mercy of God, through the love of God, to be called a child of God. Not only that, but we see Jesus who made the payment for us, who is so much, he's a King of kings and Lord of lords, being able to say he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Wow. Wow. How humbling is that? When you have a proper view of yourself, which is not one that's high and lifted up. But as the sinners that we are to say, wow, Jesus isn't ashamed to call me a brother. But it's not because of how good you are that that makes him not ashamed. The, the, the reason is because for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. It's because of that spiritual seed, because that new man is born of God through the seed of God. That's why. Because that new man is where that fellowship is of being a brother. It's a new man that cannot sin. And I'm not going to get into that. First John chapter 3 talks about that. that. That new man that's born of God. That is where that, uh, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. But, but amen for that. Uh, flip over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter number 4. This is also important that we understand the love of God and understand it properly because we have very wicked people today that want to take Scripture and turn it on its head. And I'm sure everyone here has heard the phrase, well, love is love. Right? Love is love. Yeah, love is love. <laughs> but perversion's not love. Abomination is not love. Love is love. But the, 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 these people want to take God's word and say, well, God is love. Yeah, and we're going to see that. But we're going to understand what love is, what love isn't, and we're going to look at the context where the Bible says God is love. We're going to magnify God because God is love. But it doesn't, just because God is love, it doesn't negate or invalidate the whole rest of the Bible. You have to take it all together. That's a, it's, it's like saying, well, God is love, so no one's ever going to go to hell. Well, no, 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 no. We, we already went over this. Of course people are going to hell because if you reject the free gift, if you reject Jesus Christ, that's exactly where people are going. It doesn't make God any less loving. It actually makes that love real. It actually makes that love pure. How can you say, you know, when people just reject the love that was offered, but then I'm just going to give it to them anyways. Well, hold on a second then why did Christ die? Then, then where is the, the... Well, I'm just going to give it all to him anyways. It, it would make everything just, just fall on its head. It, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's, let's get into this chapter. Look at verse number 7 here. First John chapter 4. The Bible says in verse number 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So this is talking about our love for one another and saying, hey, if, you, if you're not loving one another, if you're not loving other people, you don't even know God because God is love. Now, that's what the passage is saying. Now, because you hate things that God hates doesn't mean that you don't love other people. You can't say you don't know God because you hate things that God hates. 
not what this is saying. Because if you love as God loves, or if you love everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And that's why that four is there, because it's explaining why um, what he's talking about in context. Let's keep reading verse number nine. The Bible says, And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Basically reiterating John 3.16. Right. That is how God's love toward us was manifested. That's how it was made. That's how we know the love of God is because his only begotten son, he sent his only begotten son that we might live through him. That's where the love comes from. But the people that want to say love is love, they're not looking to live through Jesus Christ. That's not what they're talking about. But that is love, and that is the love of God. And if you want to talk about love, you cannot leave out Jesus Christ and, and what he did for us and the love of God in that, in, that, uh, in that way. Look at verse number 10. Let's keep reading here in verse, 1 John chapter 4. Verse number 10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And this is where, again, the application comes now to us, understanding God loves you. God loves you so much. Well, you ought to love other people then. And, th and this is another reason why it's important to get the love of God preaching, because if it's all just law, if it's all just commandment, if it's all just do this, do that, you're going to be imbalanced, and then the way that you treat other people, it's probably going to reflect the same way of just commandment. Just, do, just a list of rules. No, we need to understand why the rules are there. We need to understand the love of God. We need to understand then that we love God and then love other people. But the commandments are tied in with love. We're getting into that this evening. So I don't want to get too far into this subject because this morning I want to just focus on God's love for us. This evening, it's going to be our love for God. Okay? And we need to understand both. So let's keep reading here in this passage. Um, verse number 12, I think, is where we left off. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. What another awesome thing. Not only has God loved us enough to give us a free gift of eternal salvation and wants us to be with him, not only has God given his only begotten son to make the sacrifice, not only is God calling us sons of God that we could be part of his family. And not only that, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren, but then on top of all of that, God also says, well, here, I'm also going to give you the Holy Spirit and dwell within you. That's the intimacy and the closeness that God wants to have with us. What a loving God. Amen. Amen. Man, that's, that's, that is some good stuff. That is enough to make, to, that should be making you on fire enough to say, God, I want to do whatever I can for you. Because you have done way more than anyone would ever reasonably expect of a God to do. You have surpassed and went far above and beyond what anyone in the world can imagine of being called God, God is so far supreme. Where do we leave off here? Verse number 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear at torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now, the Bible says here, a perfect love casteth out fear. And I don't want to get too deep into this, but the Bible also says that we should fear God. Amen. Right? right? And the reason why we need to is because we don't have a perfect love for God. 
Now, perfect love casteth out fear. We have to have a fear of God because we have a sinful flesh. And as a loving father does, a loving father chastens his children. A loving father disciplines and corrects his children when they do wrong. And God is love, and God is a loving father, and when we do wrong, he's going to discipline us. So you know what? We need to fear God that if we decide to walk in the flesh and do wrong and sin against him, we know that he's going to come down on us. If we had a perfect love, we would be walking in God's ways without fail, without sinning. And if we had that perfect love, there's no fear in that at all. What do we have to fear? I don't have to fear any reprisal, any punishment for doing right, ever, in God. So if I have that perfect love, so the Bible says here, you know, perfect love casteth out fear. Amen. We're not there yet. We're striving to be there. But verse number 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. And that makes sense to me. You know, when we see how great love God had for us, how can we not love him? But this is what also is, I mean, why, why do we love people? We, we are fallen creatures. And we have a tendency to think about ourselves. And how often you don't care about anyone else, but when they do something nice for you, and then we do something, then, then all of a sudden you care about them, then you love them, Right? And that's part of our sinful nature. Look, God is the one who, without us doing anything for him, loved us enough to do, to do something for us, right? We have a tendency to, to withhold our love until someone else does something for us. And this is proven here. I mean, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And that's why we love God. That's a fact. Um, well, let's keep reading here. Verse number 20, the Bible says, For a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Um, turn, if you would, please, to Romans chapter 5. We're almost done this morning. There's so much to be taught on 1 John chapter 4 and a lot of all these passages. I'm really trying to keep to my notes because, man, there's, there's a lot of great content here. But I want to just focus on just God's love for us, not as much on our, what we're supposed to be doing as a result of that, loving our brethren and everything else. You can get that from 1 John chapter 4. Study that out later tonight. Go home and read 1 John chapter 4 and kind of make further application on this. But I just want to, you know, make sure we all will recognize what God has done for us and the love that he has for us and, and understand that and feel that to help us to be encouraged, to be edified, and to, to continue in the grace of God. Uh, verse number 5 of Romans chapter 5 reads, uh, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And, and the point I make here before we get any further is that without love, there's no hope, right? If, if all you have to, to think about is, is fear, there's no, there's no hope in that, right. right? Which is why the people who have a works-based salvation, they have no hope. Yeah. All you have is fear. That's good. Yeah. You, I mean, it's <laughs> You're just fearful of what's going to happen, right? But when, but when you understand the love of God to the point of just knowing that, hey, God's already paid for everything, there's hope in that. We have the hope knowing that we know we deserve the punishment. We know we're not good enough. But thank God that the love that God has, the love that God has demonstrated for us because of God's love, now I know I'm not going to be cast into that lake of fire. We have hope. Without that love, there is no hope. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And I won't keep beating that point, but he died for the ungodly. That's you and me. He died for us. He died for the ungodly. We were ungodly. Everyone is ungodly. 
at some point in their life. Verse number seven, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. This is saying, you know, it's rare that someone's going to die for a righteous man. It's rare. When you find someone willing to give their life for, some, for a righteous man, someone who's doing good, okay, I'll give my life for that person. And then he says, and you know, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. It, it is out there. There are people who will do that. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we're sinning against God, he, he commends, commends his love. His love is exalted so far above the love of man where the love of man says, well, yeah, you can find someone who might be willing to give their life for someone else who's a good guy and they love that person. But God's love so far surpasses that that even while we're sinners, Christ died for us. Amen, man. Praise God for his love and for his mercy and for his gift. One of the great things about the, the purity of God's love is that there is nothing we could ever do for him because there's nothing that God needs. So what I mean by that is that we could take comfort and solace in God's love for us because it's not fake. It's, it's completely genuine. You know, some people might show you fake love because they just want to get something in return. The flatterer, they're going to tell you nice things because they want to take advantage of you. They want something from you. People that want to hang out with the guys who have a lot of money because they want you to, you know, they want that person to give them someone. So they'll tell them all these things. They might do something for them and have a fake love. Well, we know that God's love is real because what can we possibly provide to God? What can we do to give God something that maybe he didn't have before? There's nothing that we can do for the Almighty at all. So when he gives his love to us, we know that's real. There is no reason to doubt that is a pure love, unfeigned, completely real, on a creation that doesn't deserve it, yet he still gives it to us. Turn, flip over to Romans chapter 8. You're in Romans chapter 5. And not only has he given us, chosen to love us in that manner, we have the security that he's not going to take his love away from us, that he's not going to utterly cast us out once he's already given of his love. And once we've already become a family member, once we've already been born into his family, once he's already given us the Holy Spirit, once we've already been born again, nothing can separate us from the love of God. The Bible says in Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? What is this talking about? All bad things that can happen in this life. People persecuting you, going through a famine, being without clothing, just being in perils, sword coming against you, physical harm. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Regardless of any of those things happening, what we can take comfort in is because, look, you can be sure Yea, all that, live, that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to happen. But you know where the comfort comes in? No matter what's going on, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that Christ doesn't love you when you go through these things. Let's keep reading verse 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing to come, nothing that's happened, nothing that's happening right now. There is nothing that anybody can possibly do to separate us from the love of God. Amen. 
God loves us. He's given us of his love. He sacrificed his only begotten son. And when you receive that, you have God's love eternally. Eternally. Man, that's some good news. That's some good news. Don't you think that maybe we should tell some other people about this good news? Don't you think it's worth sharing with other people? If you appreciate the love of God this morning, instead of going home this week and going about your business and living your life, don't you think maybe you ought to open up your mouth and tell someone else about the love of Christ? You think they might want to hear about that? I know I was thrilled when I found out about it. Man, I love the fact that Christ did that for me and was willing and, and, and loves me. And when I finally understood that and it got through my thick skull that it's actually not you that saves yourself, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I don't have to give myself to Christ to be saved. He gave himself for me. Amen. That's some good news. Right. Let's go share that with other people. Right. Now, I know there's going to be people that reject it. I know there's going to be people that might mock or ridicule. That doesn't matter. How, how can you just say, well, because someone might make fun of me, I'm just not even given an opportunity. I'm not even going to tell them about the love that God has for them. That's wicked. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3 is the last place we're going to look at this morning. Ephesians chapter 3. This is our drive, this is our motivation. You want to know what this church is about? If you're visiting, you want to know what our church is all about? It's about bringing the love of Christ to the people in our community and, and with our family, with our friends, with anyone that we come in contact with. As much as humanly possible, we want to tell them about the love of Christ. That is the main focus and thrust of this church. It's what we're here to do. We're here to serve. Thankful. Thankful for what God has done for us. And we're going to do what is our reasonable service to do and share what Jesus has done with other people. How could you not want someone else to receive the same thing? How could you look at someone else that God made the sacrifice for and say, yeah, they could just go to hell? Yeah, I know that you know, that person can be saved, but, they're, but yeah, I'm too busy. I've got too many other things going on. I'm nervous. I'm scared. You think Jesus enjoyed going through what he went through? Read about the Garden of Gethsemane. His sweat was dropping as, as, as blood. I mean, that's how thick and intense his moment was before his, his crucifixion on the cross and, and what he had to face and endure. That wasn't fun. And he had the power to not do it. Too. I mean, he wasn't just stuck in a situation he couldn't, he couldn't have gotten out of. It was all willful. Let's share that love. Let's let, look at Ephesians chapter 3. We're almost done. Look at verse number 14. It's the last place we're looking at this morning, and we're done. Verse number 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Let's reread that. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're part of a family. Verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love. That's the root. That's the ground. That's the foundation, man. We need to have that love of Christ that's within us and be rooted down in that because you know what? The further down the root goes, the harder it is to be shaken and to fall. We need that root. We need that ground. Verse 18, 
may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. He's saying, I, you know, I love how the verse goes, to know the love of Christ, because this is what I'm preaching. I, I want you to know the love of Christ, but it passes knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to know the love of Christ, but it passes all knowledge, because you could never, I don't think we could ever fully, 100% completely comprehend the amount of love that God has for us. It is so high and far above. But let's try to know it. <laughs> let's, let's, know, let's know that it passes all knowledge. And know how great it is that it's immeasurable. And let's, let's allow that to help us to be rooted and planted and to continue and to grow and to do and to give us motivation and encouragement and to reach more people. I hope the love of God encourages you and edifies you. It ought to. It ought to. And I thank God for His mercy and long-suffering and grace and love. Let's join together in a humble spirit, being thankful for what God has done for us, and just use that love to look a little bit deeper and, 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 and maybe make sure that we're taking the time that we ought to to hear from God and hear from His words. You know, if God loves you that much, maybe we ought to make sure we're listening to what He has to say for us. Maybe we ought to take the extra time in our week to read from the Bible. Maybe we ought to make the extra time to be praying to God and trying to communicate with God and, and communicate our needs and our desires. Don't you think it's worth it for someone that's loved you so much? How sad it is for a parent that ha that, that's loved their children has sacrificed for them, has done their best to raise that child, and then to have that child just be flippant about their parents and just not care and not want to talk to them. How sad. How sad. Let's not be those children with our Heavenly Father that, yeah, I know you did all this for me, but I'm just going to go off and, and just do whatever I want to do and not give any respect and not show any gratitude or any love. Let's not be those children. Let's recognize all that our Father has done for us and, and show our love to Him. Come back this evening and we're going to go over ways that we can show our love to God. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we, we, we love You and we thank You for loving us and for the great gift of salvation, Lord, I pray that you would please just help our church to grow, help our church to be encouraged, and, and Lord, those that, um, that are struggling and have, and have their own problems, Lord, I pray that you would please help them to just better and more fully understand your love and, and to know and to recognize what you've done for us, dear God, and, and to stop being focused on themselves. Ultimately, when we're focused on ourselves, Lord, that gets us into problems. When we're focused on our problems and everything else, and that, that just becomes our focus, as opposed to focusing on you and on others, Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to, to just stir up our souls, our spirits, that inner man, to, um, to get back right with you and, and to lead us in the right path. God, we love you and we thank you. Help us as a church to reach more people. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.